Welcome to Cultural Canvases, Black Men Reshaping Fine Art and Creative Spaces. I'm your host and curator, Badir McCleary, where in each episode we unravel the, the vibrant stories and perspective of Black male professionals reshaping contemporary creativity. This is where culture meets the canvas of life, and every episode creates a new narrative. Let's dive in. Today, we have a special guest, Brother B. Robert Moore. He's with us early in the morning for the first episode of the podcast. My brother, good morning. Thank you so much for being here this morning, bro. Hey, good morning. Thanks for having me. Um, the highest love and respect to you and everything you're doing. So Same happy to be here. Brother. Same to you, my bro. So we we've always busted up about our stuff, but like one thing that most people don't know is that, you know, there's another side to you that, you know, most people see, you know, but they don't really get a glimpse of that's the dad. That's, you know, the, 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 the son, the brother, the friend, you know what I mean? Like, let's give a little background on, you know, first of all, where are you from and how you even got started on the path that you're going? So I'm from born and raised in Des Moines, Iowa. So right in the middle of the heartland, the Midwest, in the middle of the United States. I, uh, I have an interesting background really rooted in, um, being raised by a single father due to my mother's, um, drug addiction, um, and some other things. So, um, being raised by a father who, who was former military, but also an artist in his own right. He loved sketching and doodling and he was a martial arts instructor, Chinese wushu actually. So I grew up seeing him practice and focus on a different art form my whole mm -hmm. entire life. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't later in life until I really started connecting the dots. Um, more so probably closer to, I believe, 2016 in my adulthood when I attended a museum exhibit that a friend talked me into going to um, mm -hmm. that was a solo exhibition by Jordan Weber. Mm -hmm. And Jordan is an artist in my home from my hometown as well who's been in the game a lot longer than me. Um, we grew up around the same areas, similar DNA and makeup as far as how we're identified as biracial black men, um, in Iowa, interested in the same types of things, just cultural makeup was very like separated only by a degree. Um, mm -hmm. so to see him as an adult doing art as a full-time passion and job, it was fascinating to me. It was new to me. It was eye-opening because I grew up in an era where either hustling or sports and athletics or a white collar job, doing what your parents did was nice. really the only route I saw in getting it out the mud. So when mm -hmm. I saw Jordan doing that, I was like, wow, my mind just exploded. Do you remember the first piece you saw that like drug you in? So like, you know, for the audience that don't know, like I know Jordan as well. I was able to, you know, curate shows with him. And the first piece I saw of his, was the uh, the cop car, you know, with the with the plants and everything in it. So a lot of people don't know is he was the first one that I've ever seen do that. There's a lot of people that have done that since, um, but he <laughs> did course. it at this uh, at this uh, this uh, event in Crenshaw. Um, I can't remember exactly what the event was. I'll probably put it in at the end of the show, but. It was really dope and i met him in the same way you know like i met with you very calm it must be like something with brothers from iowa like y'all y'all got a different calm about y'all i just be super chill and I, it reminds <laughs> me of some cats from philly too and you know what do you remember like the certain work that was like yo like he's speaking the same language that i speak and it's translated in a way that i understand that i can participate yeah so again i'm i'm still so new to the art world i don't know the legacy artist references or the institutional yeah. references yet um yeah. i'm kind of in my own bubble in that sense so like when i saw jordan's work it was from like the lens of a child is how i feel because i was like i was seeing art kind of for the first time mm -hmm. and it wasn't just a painting um it was performative it was conceptual um, and it happened to be also the cop car that was sawed in half um, with the plants yeah. coming out of it. And so yeah. like that was that was a trip because I, I had more questions 
as a curious mind, especially in, if I tapped into the child in me, mm-hmm. the curious mind, that's where it started. And so those questions I was always giving my dad or giving other people, mm. it kind of came back up. And so mm-hmm. the creativity was sparked, but also I had a ton of questions. How did you do this? What was the process? What was the materials? And yeah. I think that's what a lot of like art admirers respond to is it's there's a deep emotional side, of course, in the narrative and the authenticity of the work. But it's also like it's those wow moments when you're like you're blown away by how it was constructed. Either the complexity mm-hmm. or the simplicity can give me equal wow moments. Um, and so for me, it was the cop yeah. car, but it was also he had a piece where he had Jordan's rookie card. Yeah. The one that, that was, was the up. face, the, the face was burnt away yeah. and um, the face was burnt away and it was stuck inside like moon rocks. Moon or rock. a, yeah. Yeah. I had a chance yeah. to show that piece in the exhibition that he did at our gallery. I know exactly which one you're talking about. And it was, that was, it was cool. Yeah. That see, and that's what, that was where I was going to get to like with that last work too. It's like, that's something from like my childhood, you know what I mean? Like the Jordan rookie card. I don't know that I would have understood that piece as a kid. Do you think young, young B more would understand what he was seeing as a youngin? Or do you know? I I would have been like, I would have been like, why would he burn a hole in the (laughs) rookie card? That would be my first response. And you know, what's crazy. Keep in mind what I just said earlier is I was seeing all this in the the first time in the art museum since I was a child Child, with Jordan's show. I was seeing it with one of my black friends. There was a lot of black folks in a a white Iowa museum. Mm -hmm. And when I saw it, my first thought as an adult was, why the hell would he burn a hole in Jordan's rookie card? But it made me think and it provoked these emotions and these thoughts, whether they're good or bad, but that's good art. And, it, mm-hmm. and it, it sat with me. It sat with me. It's still sitting with me because I'm talking about it. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I think is good art is like art that's not just seen, but it's felt and it sticks with you, whether it's disruptive or it's confirming or, or calming, comforting. It just sticks with you. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I still, I, you know, if I revisited that work today, I would see it differently because I feel like I'm maturing from, I'm keeping the child in me still, the curiosity, mm-hmm. but I'm also like, I'm understanding art in an intimate way um, where my questions usually come from a different place than, than um, resistance. It's more like mm-hmm. I accept mm-hmm. what I'm seeing and then my questions are still there, but it's more of seeking to understand mm-hmm. um, I dig approach. That. So like you said something really, really, uh, int- uh, really cool right there. You said like the intimacy and, you know, once I, when I started to understand and notice your work, your, your, a lot of your work speaks from the perspective of a child, you know uh-huh. what I mean? There's a lot of kids in your work. And I think that in a good way disarms the viewer, yeah. you know, it, it brings people into the message that you're trying to relay almost as if like you're you're talking to yourself as a child, like you're re you're revisiting your childhood and teaching them about things that, you know, maybe you want to want to teach your kids when they're older. Maybe you are teaching kids now, you know, maybe you want to show in a different light because the story's tough. How has your work uh, been able to, to translate to not only just kids who visit your exhibitions, but your own kids? Um, That's a good question. Um, I saw something recently and it said it was like from a therapist or a mental health like page. And it was Mm -hmm. what we who we are as adults is who we wanted to have be for us as children. Mm -hmm. And I think right now in this moment, I'm realizing subconsciously what you just called out that I'm doing is. I started with this trauma that was based in my childhood. Mm-hmm. I have this residual trauma as a as in a black man. I have this isolated trauma as a child. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean it doesn't carry with me. I'm just talking about in a linear time of points yeah. of events. Yep. And so like as I've as I've spoken or done some of those works on that initial childhood trauma, 
I've started to come out and realizing, again, subconsciously, that it's important for me to be able to speak universally. Mm -hmm. And my black skin isn't mm -hmm. received universally. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, I'm always trying to figure out how to crack that door so it lets a little light in and see who, who might see it. Um, without swinging the door all the way open and shine the light on everyone and everyone's uh, uptight, too tense, or closed off. I need that curiosity to be, be pulled in. And so yeah. I think there's a psychological approach in focusing on children, using military um, mm -hmm. to really tap into a universal audience that isn't just America Black. Mm -hmm. It's it's global. Um and it does, it transcends age because uh, we yes. were all children once. So like those layers of symbolism in my work, the layers of what I'm presenting to be able to touch more people isn't for the end result of a sale. Mm -hmm. That That's going to come because it just takes one person to buy your work. For me, right. for me, it's more so how many people can I touch in, in the sense of like my grandfather's a, a preacher, a pastor. So like sermons and music and that message, those are all the same to me. Yes. How I paint. So with with that being said, how do you how do you go about when youth visit your exhibitions and you know, because they completely disregard exhibition details and titles and all that, right? When they approach the work and they give you their explanation of what you created. How does how does that reflect on you as a creator? And you know, you've curated shows as well. How does that reflect on you as the curator of your own work? Oh, well, I mean, as a dad, I have to answer first. My favorite people to ask and the first people I usually ask of their opinion of my work are my children. They mm -hmm. paint on my canvases. They have some, use on m most of my work, they have some kind of touch. So to see, to see that initial point of, of insertion of my children being in the work, mm -hmm. when it's in public setting, I love to see how children recognize those little things in the work that draw them in. Again, that cracked yeah. light in the door. Yeah. That cracked light in the door is universal. L light is universal. It doesn't discriminate. Mm -hmm. So then it's like, who's catching that light? And it's cool because it, a child's perspective is going to see light even differently than mm -hmm. an adult. They'll yes. say, oh, it looks like a line or I see a rainbow or I see a shape. It isn't flat. Mm -hmm. So their, their feedback's usually some of my favorite because it's something I didn't see. That's so dope. And it's like you, we, we sometimes look to art as you know that's childish quote unquote you know or immature as a way of not being able to see but then on the flip side we sometimes go to children for that confirmation of what's good or what's not good because we know children they don't have to lie you know what i mean they don't they don't have to tell you that they like something when they really don't you know they'll let you know in a minute we know i mean i have nieces and nephews if they don't like being somewhere, they let you know from jump, I don't want yeah. to be here. You right. know? Um, and I think when we talk about, you know, that participation, you know, being that we're talking about the youth in the work um, with a lot of programs that focus on the arts and schools and things like that, how have, you know, the, the youth that you work with, including your kids taken to be Robert Moore, the teacher, you know, how have they understood that they can be a participant in this art world and not just a spectator? To me, that's a very delicate thing. Mm -hmm. Situationally, I have public opportunities where I can speak to kids in schools or groups or organizations. And that's, that's great. Because again, I'm opening a door, I'm letting some light out, and there's a, based on my words and my story and my work, there's a kid or two that's gonna catch that light. Mm -hmm. That's a numbers game to me, it's beautiful. Cause I just need one or two in every one of those settings. My yep. kids are a little different. Mm -hmm. I grew mm -hmm. up with a dad who, who was very passionate about the things he was passionate about, and I admire that about him. He fished every day, he practiced martial arts every day. But he, by no, 
by no choice of mine, I was included in those activities. Mm -hmm. So by the time over years of being in those activities, I wasn't as interested in those activities. So I've been very delicate to not overexpose what I do to my own inside home. Mm -hmm. But also when I talk to public in public settings to kids, I make sure that I'm not dressing up what I do as the only like avenue. I paint, I create. That that's one thing. But when I think think about art holistically, what I really focus on is making sure I'm including all those things. Cause I, yeah. I wanna I wanna get as much light shining on as much kids as possible because they needed, I needed, like we talked yeah. about earlier, I needed someone like this that looked yeah. kind of cool, that seemed kind of chill, that that I could kind of relate to, that I could see myself hanging out with, or maybe even mm -hmm. looking like when I'm older, um, non-conventional to a degree, but doing something they love. And I needed yeah. someone like that in my face, in front of me, giving me those examples to have that light inside my head go off to say, oh, yeah. I could do this too. And Jordan's show did that for me in a way. He was it was in my face and it made me say, ah, 30 something years old at that time. I didn't know I could do this. Yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. So like hell yeah. <laughs> as as we as we build on, you know, just going to shows and seeing shows, after that first show, what did you what did you think about not only art practice, but the art world? Because you know that, you know, materials are all around us. You know, we see that in all types of work, especially in your work. That's one thing I love about what you do is you use a lot of everything that's around you. Um, but like, how did the art world, you know, shape you? Like seeing that, you know, not only was Jordan, you know, creating dope work, but it was in a place that people actually agreed to come to, agreed to, you know, support, agreed to uh, uh, show up to um, and actually talk about this work, actually buy this work, collect this work. How did that how did that uh, embrace you or how was it introduced to you? Uh, we're about to get into some stuff now. Um, <laughs> I didn't think nothing of the art world when I left his show. I could only think of the art. Mm. I wasn't Good I wasn't in the mind space to even think about what those other layers were. I was like, oh, this mm -hmm. is, it was, I was overstimulated, I think, to a degree. Mm -hmm. But after going and buying a canvas or two and doing some abstract stuff with some oil paints that frustrated me, um, I, 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 I set everything down for a minute and did normal life. I came back to it later, and when I came back to it later and started getting a little bit more serious, I had to clear, personally, I had to clear some things in my own mm -hmm. way around my drug addictions and my alcoholism. Mm -hmm. But once I did, <laughs> a couple of things, too, is I didn't think about any of the institutions or the, the industry. Mm -hmm. I thought, like I think most people, I can do this, too. And it wasn't in a disrespectful tone to what Jordan was doing. But it was like my own self-belief, whether naive or not, mm -hmm. because of the, the level of practice I was in very elementary, I still yeah. had that spark that said, I could do this. And I think that's yeah. important because I think people disrespectfully say I can do that and then don't. And then there's people that say I can do that and then do it. And I respect those people because you ain't just talking shit about the art. Most um, definitely. And so... Leaving, leaving that it took me a while, but once I did start getting serious and cleared some, some cobwebs out of my own head, I called galleries here locally and stopped in and visited in my own hometown, which is Iowa. Not a lot of them are like as blue collar or whatever, mm -hmm. blue chip, I mean. Yeah. Um, so I called some and I got humbled. They, my work was so early developed, but I thought I, I had this entitlement, I think, in my head, mm. thinking I'm doing something, get me in, and I'm mm -hmm. swallowing my pride enough to come and present the work and come and kind of put my tail between my legs and say, can I show? And I got humbled, mm. and it pissed me off. Mm. And again, you know, I could talk about it, be mad about it, but I was like, I'm going to do something about it. And so yeah. instead of focusing locally, which is I think is a lot of artists do, is they say, we're not all in major markets. 
So a lot of artists say, I'm going to build my own reputation here locally. Well, we have so much power at our fingertips globally, globally. that that's a really tough, even Jordan, who I look up to, he did it kind of a mixed bag, working locally and outside in, where I said, yeah. fuck it early on and said, I'm working outside in because mm -hmm. I ain't wasting my time with these folks here in town like this. And I don't think there's a right or wrong. It's just, yeah. It's just, it's just different ways of approaching it. So once I got humbled, I started calling galleries like Kazmine Gallery in New York and mm -hmm. a bunch of other ones pretending to be a collector. <laughs> so I could understand the game. And this yeah. is my long answer for you asking what I think of the industry is I started doing research. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have a 15, 20 page white paper I did for myself just in stats and data and trying to understand the industry. Cause while I was maturing in my own practice, I was like 50% is what they charge artists. I was like from a business mind, a hustler, my corporate mind was like, there's gotta be a disruptive model. Yeah. So that's, yeah. Why I was that's why I was originally focused on before my own craft, to be honest. Yeah. That, that's, and that's one of the things that I learned, you know, uh, I was a gallerist early, um, and coming into the game and, you know, trying to be as fair as possible, you know, in a gallery space. And you get, again, humbled early to where there is truly no fair when it comes to a lot of this um, because someone is going to lose. And, you know, I've talked to different artists, you know, and had them say, hey, you know, make sure that the gallery is for you. Um, because yeah, some galleries take 50%, some, some take more depending on what, what they're bringing you. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I've heard some take as much as 75%, but if they've raised your price point from 2000 to 200,000, it kind of change, you know, so a lot of artists would, you know, like to be in that ballpark. So they're yeah. willing to take some sure. of those deals, but you know, a lot of artists don't know. Um, so it's, it's. I think it's very, it's very uh, brilliant of you to understand from that collector standpoint going in as an artist um, and just getting to get privy to some of the information that these galleries give collectors that they might have held from artists. You know what I mean? Um, how do you think that that allowed you to approach your inventory, approach your marketplace, approach what you were producing out into the market. It was critical. It was everything. Mm -hmm. That information, it was so, it's like, it's like running a race and having no information. Mm -hmm. What the fuck are you running for? <laughs> At least something do five laps or you're running a 40 meter or this is just practice something. Mm -hmm you still might be lost because you might not know how many times you might not know how, if they're going to make you run it back, but having mm -hmm. no information is so dangerous. It's reckless. So yeah. I had, I had to have some information. Once I did, it was so critical, man, because I, at the time I just got my feelings hurt by some local galleries. So I, instead of calling them, I said, let me call some of the big dogs. Yeah. And when I called the big dogs and pretend to be a collector, I got enough information because when I pretend to be a collector, they gave me information they wouldn't have given me if I was pretending to be someone else or just being myself. Mm -hmm. So I'm playing the game that they're playing on me. Um, and once I had that, basically what I was doing and what I would advise most people that are looking for a gallery and like feeling like they can't do it on their own unless a gallery finds them. I'm not anti-gallery, but while you're doing that, most importantly, focus on the work. Make mm -hmm. the most important shit you possibly can because it's the only thing that's going to get you anywhere anyways. After you focus on the work and yourself, your mind, body, and soul, um, you should, while you're waiting on a gallery to discover, discover you, you should do research and understand how to build your practice to do for your collectors and do for your customers what a gallery would do for you. Big facts. And Big that's, facts. The biz that's the business of it. It was the quality of the paper. It was the additions. It was how they responded. It was how they format. I mean, everything was being analyzed because I was like, I don't want to miss something. And I want someone to come through my door and leave and be like, damn, that was nice. And yeah. the work's good. Yeah. So tell me, how, how do you think the 
the repetition of seeing your father do karate, you know, being a part of those things that kind of built a part of your character. How do you think that goes into how you approach your practice and your business? Because you seem very structured, you know, the way, like you just talked about with additions and other parts of the work, you release them very well. They do very well. You've, you've been able to establish a, a good structure in how you present your business. How do you think that plays into, or if it plays at all into how you approach that? Um, I mean, my dad was military and a martial artist, so there was a lot of routine and regimented, but he was a hard worker. I was around no lazy people my whole life. Everyone did something in the house, outside the house. We all moved. We all made bread. We all ate together, too. Um, so when I look at other artists and I look around the community, curators, galleries, man, work ethic, the quality of the work. There's a lot of beautiful art out there, so much, and it's going to be missed. And I'm going to tell, I could look an artist in his face and tell him it's beautiful work, but you ain't going to go nowhere because there's one thing missing mm. and that's work ethic. Mm. I see it all the time when they're, when mm. you love something so much mm -hmm. like this, like creating, this isn't a nine to Facts. five. When you Facts. love something so much, your worth ethic is organic. It's natural because you love it that much. It comes, it isn't even something that has to be taught. Exactly. Exactly. Like, how and do you, you see think, it? I, I was going to ask, how do you think, uh, like certain, certain artists respond to your work ethic? I mean, we've all done collaborations, you know, we've been a part of group shows and things like that. How have you responded to the work ethic of others and how has, their work ethic, you know, impacted you? Um, work ethic and speed aren't the same. Mm -hmm. And so what's been hard for me is making sure I'm not dangling the, the productivity I'm having based on my speed or my work ethic or how I paint because we're all different. So it's, mm -hmm. I, you know, I actually hold back a lot. Mm. I don't, I don't, I don't shit. I mean, I'm grinding from six eight till one in the morning and up at six to paint again. If I don't have my kids, I don't okay. share that all the time because mm -hmm. that gives that high performing culture mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. the hustle pure, culture. like, yeah, the, the I ain't no, ain't everybody ain't ready for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A lot of people can't yeah. handle that. So I, I hustle, but I, I don't share it all. So like, I think it's hard because I'm an inspiring character. Mm -hmm. I like to be inspiring. I like to be inspired. Um, I would love to inspire by sharing that more, but I think it isn't always received with that because artists also need mm -hmm. rest. Mm -hmm. Some need more than others. Um, some are in a great situation where they're working hard but, and they've got their price up, but half their money is going somewhere. Hmm. Some of us are in another situation where half our money isn't going somewhere, but we're doing everything ourselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's no perfect world. I ain't mad at either side of the table. Facts. But we eat at different paces and we move at different paces. So it's been a really balancing act for me to make sure I respect my community and the oath. And that goes from not only my pro tip productivity that I publicly share, mm -hmm. but also my pricing structure. I have ultimate respect for the masters and the OGs that came before me, um, even in a very tough conversation like pricing and art. Yeah. Before we, before we get to like all the pricing stuff, like what's a goal that you've had as an artist now that you've understand, understood, I should say that there's, you know, there's not just paint on canvas, you know, that you can actually make a career. You can actually have some of your wildest dreams come true. You can meet some of the people you've always wanted to meet. Like how, what are some of the, the goals artistically that, you know, that you want to reach, you know, now that you're understanding all of this around you more? My, my goal has always been to remain independent for as long as possible. Um, I say that because I look at, this art game, mm -hmm. it is a game. A lot of businesses right. and industries mm -hmm. are games. I look at this art game like dating. Mm -hmm. 
So I always have. And so I'm like, I tell my friends, I'm like, oh, you signed with that gallery. I'm like, have you shown with them before? And I'll never, I don't always give them prescription, prescription, but I'm also trying to get them to find the answer for themselves. Like I do with my yeah. kids. Yeah. So I'll ask these open-ended questions, knowing what I'm trying to get to, but I'll ask being like, or if you showed with the gallery, how many of those collectors came from your Rolodex? Mm -hmm. Cause then you're just giving a check, you know, like where's the partnership? If I go on a date with a girl, I ain't expecting her to necessarily pay, but I'm, I'm, I'm observing her character. Yeah. I'm observing our chemistry. I'm not going to get married on the first date, i.e., et cetera, sign a gallery <laughs> contract. I would like to work up towards that. So, um, but you know, a I, lot of people, they, they see the pretty girl or the pretty gallery and they're signing that first day because they feel that they'll never have a chance again. Yeah. And if you, know, you sit, if you sit back and watch, well, you see how those relationships turn out too. Oh, facts. Every time. That's Every a, that's time. A big facts. That's a big facts. So I, when we, as we're still talking about the work, like I'm, I'm interested in. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't even answer. I didn't even answer you the goal. Um, yeah, no, yeah, please. My, my goal was actually to show my work in the Des Moines Art Center, which is our premier mm. museum. That that same place I saw Jordan Weber's work. That was a ten year goal of mine set in 2020 to hit by 2030, and this year 2024 I'll be hitting it. That's fire. And that's really interesting because like you've shown in the big cities, you've shown in the New York's, LA's, Miami, like you've shown in all the big cities and your major goal. I was expecting like Venice Biennale or, you know, Hong Kong, a cave in, you know, Italy or something. But you said the Des Moines, you know, like, I think that's, I think that's fire because it's like, kind of like what you were saying, you're going global to come back in to really show you know, the town, like, yo, this is like, I've already, I've told y'all motherfuckers, like, this is <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, I yeah. told y'all this is what it was like. And it's, and again, it's not to, it's not for you to gloat. You're not trying to gloat. No. You're just trying to tell them like, look, like this is what happens when you believe in yourself. And that's where, you know, a lot of those other questions earlier was, you know, saying, because you'll be an example for, a, a, a little B. Robert Moore, or, you know, another little artist, a, a, you know, someone out there that's saying, yo, he did it. I could do it too. You know what I mean? He's from this neighborhood. He's from this block. He went to this school. You know, he picked up this brush first. He saw this artist, you know, you, you're going to be replicating that experience for somebody else, you know? And I think that's, I think that's very, you know, it's, it's one of those uh, hero's journey moments, you know what I mean? Where, you have to go out to come back in. And when you come back, you know, you're labeled as the hero because you've faced the trials and tribulations and everything. And now you're looked upon back where you return as the person that survived that journey. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. I no, you I get, you get it, bro. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's so fire. So thank you. What's, I know this is probably tough. You know, what's, what do you think is your most impactful piece so far to you? What did you not, not one that you just enjoyed making? I would say one that you knew you had to make, but you didn't know how it would be well received. Oh. Yeah. I, I figured that one would be a little bit, you know what I mean? I, ha I have two of them okay. that come to mind. Um, I, when I first started, you know, like being very serious about this towards the end of 2019, early 2020, mm -hmm. I was doing a few different styles because I didn't go to art school. So at least what I've learned about art school, at least one thing I know that's a consistent is you usually go through different mediums, different types of art as you kind of develop your own style and practice. Mm -hmm. So being self-taught, I was trying to, I'm still trying to go through as many things as possible. Um, yeah. So I have, um, some works that are earlier that were more in an expressionism style. And mm -hmm. it's interesting because it's something Hebrew Brantley told me one time in his a studio visit. He said, I love your different styles. He's like, and even I did this earlier, but a lot of black artists tend to naturally go towards an expressionism or a Basquiat type reference because it's, it is our, it is our pinnacle like our top point reference for black artists. And it's not mm -hmm. necessarily hard, no disrespect, but it's not as hard to execute. 
And this is just me being vulnerable and also sharing so people can also look at themselves in the mirror because yeah. this was a really important part for me. It had me not focus as much on that. I love that work. I still mm. do it as my journaling. I do it all the time and ain't nobody going to ever tell me to stop. I maybe yeah. do a show in 10 years that's based on those works, but it's not mm -hmm. my focus right now because there's a saturation of it. I'm trying to be different. Yeah. yeah. But I was doing those early works and they were expressionism, so they were emotional. I did a crucifixion of a crack baby piece. Mm. And that was a that was a, a iconography reference of the crucifixion, which has been done multiple times. Um, and growing up in a Christian home, but also having that abandonment from my mother, so I actually did the Venturian man on the cross, reaching out to multiple inherited biological addictions wow. that I inherited. It's just a really powerful piece that was so powerful early on, like that I know if I reposted it again, it, but I don't want to get mixed identity. But that yeah. was a really important piece because that was me being vulnerable and it was a really like big moment for me to open up. Um, the second and probably most important piece so far in my mm -hmm. art history was the America Made Us Crazy in my LA show with the straight mm -hmm. jacket. Mm -hmm. My mom and I were sitting on the couch and I'm actually in the process of getting an actual straight ja jacket fabricated which was the original idea is to take old pieces of a flag and have it fabricated into an actual straight jacket that'll be in a, in a frame or display. Mm -hmm. So I was wow. talking to my mom. I'm like, that there's a process to that. Mm -hmm. But what I can do right now, which is cool being multifaceted, multidisciplinary is I can paint the, the, the drawing. I can, I can sketch the concept. Now the other parts can come later. So my mom and I were sitting on the couch and I had this idea and I was like, we both started crying because it was powerful and she has mental health issues. And I have that I have, I've struggled with some, um, many of my brothers and sisters have struggled with mental health issues because of the biological trauma we've inherited through mm -hmm. the history of the United States. And mm -hmm. I ran in my studio and painted like an eight by 10 on belt on Russian burlap, wow. which is really hard to paint on. It's a, it's a, it's a material that's the old masters used to use, but I do my studies on those because it's just challenging. And I did the study and it was just, it was one of those pieces when I look at our history and you'll probably respect this, but dear is if I can create something that still holds the same relevancy a hundred years ago, as it would a hundred years from now, I know I did something. Mm -hmm. And I look at every single one of the pieces I create with that lens after I'm done and some I'm like, ah, I did it. Very yeah. few actually. And most of them I'm like, oh no, it's a really good painting, but I don't know if this will hold hundred years prior. It'll hold a hundred years later, but I don't know if I could go back with it. Hmm. That flag and the straight jacket I could. Do you do you think that for you it may not hit that mark, but for the viewer, it may be exactly that? Have you seen any of those type of like I guess, confrontations, you know, between, you know, not really a aggressive confrontation, but, you know, you're, you're saying like, you know, I like this, but I could have done this. I could have done this, but the viewer or a collector, even a family member is saying, no, you know, this is moving me in a way that maybe you're not even seeing. Have you ever had anything like that? I don't usually critically critic. I'm not usually critical of my work in front of other people. Mm hmm. Okay. By the time it's in a public setting, I've done all the criticizing. Gotcha. Um, what I will share with them sometimes is I was going to do this, but changed my mind and did this. Mm. And that's mm. usually an aesthetic conversation. Um, so I guess I haven't, I haven't yet. Um, I, I confrontations definitely been a conversation in some of my works. Um, it's not, I mean, Something that one of my favorite musicians said, it's provocative, it gets the people going. It's something I think about when I finish my work. So I'm like, what's this gonna do? It can be mm -hmm. it could be a straight jacket or it can be one of the pieces that open up and you have that moment. Yeah. But those pieces get people talking like and I took if I took myself out of it, yeah. that straight jacket piece is one of my most important works. But these pieces that are interactive, I've never seen a line of people yeah crowding and blocking people from seeing other works in the group show because they're mm -hmm. just waiting for that mona lisa wow moment where they can open up the canvas and see what's underneath that's just different do you do you feel that this new contemporary art age of engagement you know that's 
been almost induced by uh, the new shiny digital, you know, neon type of works that allow people to Instagram, take photos, that they're excited to have that participation with the work now um, to where it's not just for, okay, I'm going to Instagram this, but I want to learn why the artist is doing this. Do you, do you see that a little bit more? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I can't say if I see it more. Mm-hmm. I've always found that people have different languages that they they hear and they speak to. Some are visual, some are written, some are verbal. And so that's why there's always been a written component to my work mm-hmm. with the mm-hmm. visual. I don't need everyone to read my one or two or three paragraphs. I don't actually care. But if you are someone that reads and you want to know, I'm also trying to eliminate questions. I don't want my DMs flooded with what <laughs> the interpretation of this piece. It's right there. Yeah. You want to go deeper? We can. We can go way deep. We could talk about any one of my works all day. But for yeah. right now, I've given you just enough to get in my head. Um, and that takes me out of the conversation a little bit because that human currency is probably the most uh, draining. Um, yeah. It's draining. So yeah. I'll try to I try to reduce that. <laughs> so that's one thing I was gonna ask too, like with the human currency, like um what's what's the demand of you know being an artist, you know, especially a black artist and doing the work that you do, what's the demand on getting these ideas and messages out? And do you feel that sometimes like you're putting too much out? or you're, you're, you're not getting enough out. You're not putting the message out enough because your works are, they're very interpretive. And with the right mind, people can get a lot of great educational thought and everything about them. But then some of them can also be taken the wrong way. Mm-hmm. You know, how do you, how do you, you know, balance that? You know, or is is that something you even think about after the work's done and you're ready to exhibit it or do a print or anything like that? Um, Because I I, I guess one of one of uh, the works that I saw that was I felt brilliant was like the uh, uh, it was like the uh, the little kid. It was like uh, in like the ebony box or something like that. It was like a little, it was like a cartoon. Oh, I can't remember. I had it saved in my little document somewhere. You talking about you had... the, pe- the penis I do? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. The reimagined characters? I thought that was brilliant. You Thank know you. what I mean? And, you know, it's 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 taking a traditional idea. It's kind of like how, you know, how I kind of see Gary Simmons' work. Yeah. Um, when he erases the, you know, the chalkboard and things, which I, I honestly didn't understand until like four years ago. Yeah. Um, so I love about revisiting these works and, you know, seeing how they do. But, you know, I, I, I guess my question is like, how, how, how do you go about con- not controlling the messaging? I think that sounds wrong, but like being able to keep the same messaging while the distribution is high, you know, you know what I mean? Because it's like the yeah. more you get out, the more you put it out there, the messaging just gets completely lost. I mean, we grew up in the hood, you know, Nikes, you know, if they were only for a selected group, they will probably be air force ones, you know, but in certain areas, because they're everywhere, they're Hovas, you know, they're AF ones. They're all these different names because they've been adopted, you know, how how have you felt your works have been adopted by collectors? How does that human currency, ad, you know, weighed in on your practice? I hope it's, that's it, a better way. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's very important. I have if you're getting original work from me, everyone has to speak to me just like this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's not even like have to. It's like there's no other way usually, unless it's one of the rare shows I'm usually usually mm-hmm. showing in. And only early on did I not ask the gallerist to include me on the conversations or at least keep me aware of who's looking at buying the work. Mm-hmm. So there's a couple, there's a couple that I had that um, I missed, but otherwise I'm very personal. Um, you got to yeah. talk to me. This is, this is something I'm not looking to sell if it means I can't speak to who's going to own it forever. Cause I'd rather keep it. 
Um, yeah. I create work like that, like work where I'm like, I'm cool. I'll sit on it. And I also need the work to authentically connect with people. So those, the peanuts and the Jetsons and all the reimagined works that I've done, there's, there's some over on the wall off the camera. Um, I broke those off of my main page into a separate brand because of what I said earlier about the Basquiat's and the different things I was doing. Mm -hmm. I didn't want any confusion around my brand identity. And I actually, yeah. I might've taken a temporary hit for mm -hmm. that, but it's long, long game, big picture plays. And so. Temporary hit, how? I mean, I think. Well, that... because if I were to post one of the Lucy sculptures or mm -hmm. the Jetsons painting on my main page today, because of the universe and the attraction, it, inc it increases my chances of commissions it's just more exposure of my own network on the other page it has 9,000, which is great because they're all about just that work. I know that they're very focused community, but it's I put all my focus into the 9,000 versus the 40 something thousand. Yeah. And I'm okay with that because again, um, my connection to the people is based on how they respond to the work and those peanuts and pop car pop cartoons that I reimagined, they're only still alive today because yeah. of the people. People, yep. I would have retired that. They're not they're not my favorite thing to paint, but I don't dislike mm -hmm. it. What my currency there is the joy that I see in the mirror from people that see themselves in this work, which is mm -hmm. exactly why I first did these works. And then when I see yeah. that, it brings me back to I remember how I felt. Mm -hmm. This is important work. This is like, this is like me doing missionary work, kind of like this is important work because the people want it. People ask me for it. So, yeah, exactly. And one it, second, it, I'm sorry. No, no worries. Had to shut the door. The kids are being a little loud. <laughs> no worries. Um, yeah. To to jump back into, it, I was going to say, you know, it it brings us back to you know, that that childlike feeling you know, that approach. And, and it also takes me to the, the, the panel we had at your uh, exhibition at Think Space with the brother DeAndre, when he was saying um, how much it touched him and you could visibly see it in his face, you yeah. know? And I thought that that was a very, very, just a, a, an amazing representation of what you just said of how you want to connect with these collectors. Because personally, I feel that, you know, with with contemporary, especially ultra contemporary art um, being so popular and so profitable that I don't feel that art is lived with enough, you know, for people to get that type of reaction. Um, yeah. You know, you could see that he walked up to a piece he immediately felt or saw himself um, mm -hmm. in that work and was able to take that work, internalize it into his home, into something that was representative of him, you know, and the way he spoke of it, how it changed the conversations with his family, um, it changed the conversations with himself. Um, I don't think collectors today really spend time enough with an artwork to allow it to do that to them. Um, mm -hmm. That's not to say that every artwork can do that you know we know that there's some works that you know you can literally see that just don't have a, a a backbone i i would say you know it was just it's just there but then there's some works that you know you see fifth sixth seventh time and you learn something new you know I've, there's works that you know i i live with and you walk by at a certain angle and you see something different um how have you how have you seen collectors change with the collecting of your work? Like, let's say they've owned one and then the second one, they may go in a different direction or the second one adds on to something that they've already built because you're understanding their narrative through your work, because now they're speaking to you by collecting. Here's something I absolutely have known in the short, short span of time I've been in this art industry is I have some of my favorite stories and I have these more than I have less mm -hmm. is you're the first original piece of art that I ever purchased. Um, Yvette Bowser, Aisha Seldine, Tay Diggs, mm -hmm. shit, maybe even Gail King. 
I'm the first, and these are not regular folks. I'm not mm -hmm. even name dropping. I could do this no, on yeah, on, yeah. A, on a non collector, non celebrity scale too, because money's money. Facts. But these are people with wealth that are coming to me and saying your work, which is very humbling, but your work pulled me in. That light attracted me so much that yeah. now I'm wanting to collect. And the beautiful part about that is someone that loves his brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. he's already know how this works. Because I'm a collector and I love art. Mm -hmm. You get one piece, I can't possibly fill up anybody's house with my own work. Plus, that's not part of my practice. It's against mm -hmm. some of the rules I have. Even yeah. though I've had some collectors that have tried. Oh, yeah, um, they will. <laughs> but what's beautiful about that is it, it can't possibly be a forever thing. So what happens is they end up bringing others in. Mm -hmm. So this mm -hmm. ecosystem happens, whether it's for me or another artist, this ecosystem happens. So what I do yeah. see now is I find myself in the rooms, either mm -hmm. I'm in there first or I'm in there after, but I'm mm -hmm. in the rooms with same people, works I relate to, which mm -hmm. tells me that there's a common identity that us, me, artists on this side, collector in the middle and the other artists on this side are feeling. And then you can notice that as an artist in the other artist's work. And then the identity of the collector being being developed there, you see who they are based on how you see yourself. And it's like a three-way mirror, bro. It's crazy. I, and it keeps happening. It's like, oh, you're in their collection? Oh, yeah. oh, that's my bro. Oh, that's my sis. Like, yeah. of course you are. And then we put each other on. So what do you think as an artist? Because I've heard some crazy stories and we don't have to drop any names, but what do you think is the craziest thing you've heard from a collector about either collecting art, trying to collect your art or a, a past collecting experience? And I ask that because we have a few good cases uh, in the news right now with some collector mishaps and things like that. And I always like to ask artists, um, what are what are some of their craziest collector stories? Craziest collector stories. Um, and it doesn't have to be nothing that like blows the head off, but just it could be something yeah. that you you didn't know before that you know now you know, and it's just like ah, you know, they they got they got one on me. <laughs> oh, um, I that has happened a couple times. Um, it's it hasn't been on the originals as much mm -hmm. as it's been on the prints, but some print mm -hmm. out some print shops and some print like auction houses will buy your print mm -hmm. and will mess your pricing up in a secondary market. And I've mm -hmm. actually had to message them directly because the street street dude to me comes at out and I'm like, yo, you need to knock that shit off. You can't do that. I I don't approve or whatever the right terminology is. No, yeah. stop, please. <laughs> um, and so that's happened a couple times, but. I think my biggest surprising thing, I don't have as many crazy stories yet. I'm grateful for that. I know it's yeah. only the time they'll happen. I had three originals get lost in the shipment, um, personally from a FedEx mess up. And that was originals that I that I had just recently created and a couple that I had from a previous year and the year prior. So works I had held on to, so that really stung. Um, but biggest thing I'm surprised by is cl realizing collectors don't have their works insured. I'd say. Because yeah. and that's not even because that's a specific story. That's because mm -hmm. of anything that could come, that could go wrong. That's going to be a critical part of the story. So I got all these fires, the smoke I see out in the field, and I'm like, man, one of those are going to turn into a fire. So that's probably the craziest yeah. thing. Yeah, I had a I had a collector friend, um, really good friend of mine who I worked with. Um, on different things, you know, helping them source, you know, different works. I haven't got a chance to sell anything directly to them yet, which I'm, you know, waiting to get a good piece in my mind, you know, in my hands to 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 work with them on. But uh, I've helped them understand about insurance, disaster recovery, and things like that. And he, he kind of always put it to the back burner. And then one day he called me because um, he wanted to reach out to an appraiser and a few other things because he had a flood in his house. Um, and uh, the bottoms of a few of his paintings had got water damage, you know, and the first thing he asked him, you know, are these insured? And he was just like, you know, don't, don't ask me that because, you know, they weren't. And, you know, it just touches to the point that, you know, a lot of collectors will buy a lot of, uh, you know, pretty pricey works or works that they don't know the value of period and just have them, 
you know, willy nilly in the house without any paperwork to protect themselves, you know, but I will ask you as an artist, do you think that that goes to them not looking at art as an investment or just being a careless collector? Yeah, it, it's, I'm, I'm going to take a naive stance because there's not a plethora of education and there's so many people out there delivering information that really shouldn't be that mm-hmm. it gets messy. But what yeah. I would say is this simple conversation I have, like a couple like rhetorical questions I ask people when mm-hmm. I'm talking to them is, would you insure your car that you bought? I don't care if it's a Chevy or a Benz. And then like, if anybody says anything about pricing of art, I'm always like, man, have you bought a couch recently? <laughs> because I can't find a couch for under four or five grand. And right. usually then I keep it for four or five years at least. So at least the art you have forever. So there's just some pondering rhetorical questions I like to ask people. Again, I'm a dad, so I'm going to ask a question that's going to make you yeah. think. So you can come up with an answer on your own. Um, yeah. <laughs> So you you brought up something really cool that gives me a good segue. Um, you said with like when you buy a couch and you keep it four or five years, um, how do you feel if when or if you see your work that you sold, let's say a year or two ago, turn back up into the market? How does that make you feel as an artist? I'm gonna be I'm gonna be mad as hell if I didn't hear about it first, and I want everyone to know that I could post mm-hmm. that once a year on my Instagram page with no remorse, letting them know. Because first of all, if you bought an original from me, we talked about it because I mention it every time. If you bought an original from me, it's in the electronic terms conditions of the invoice you sign. That don't matter. I know those can't be upheld in court very well, regardless of Destiny, Sutton, Ross, or whoever else is doing it too. What we're trying to do is make sure we have right to refuse, first right to refusal, that we have some positions, we have some skin in the game, where if it does get flipped, we have a chance to be a part, participate in that and potentially get a kickback royalty. Those are not unreasonable things to ask. So mm-hmm. if I, 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 I've been in Sotheby's twice and I knew it was coming months before I knew I knew the game that collectors were playing with it too. Mm-hmm. And I appreciate that because they're actually respecting my request. And that's let's have a relationship and not make this transactional. Yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Do you do collectors that play the right way or when it comes to that? Are are they offered, you know, that first first dibs on the work? Do you feel more comfortable with them owning and conserving your works? Um, because they've shown that interest, they've shown that will of protecting or how important is a new collector versus that collector that, you know, will take care of those works. I treat everyone the same. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, we do have rapport and history with someone that's collected before. Um, and having four or five of my works doesn't mean as much if I don't know what you plan to do with them, if they're just going to be in your home. I mean, I, I respect that and I need to make a living. But if I have someone else new that's going to be like, hey, I want to try to get these out publicly. I want to loan these a couple of times. And they're 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 really leaning in to the industry. You know, they're going to museums. They're going to gallery shows like this is probably my biggest pet peeve. Anybody that's a claims to love the art, but isn't really showing me they're invested in loving the arts. Mm. It doesn't make any sense to me. So it's a red flag. Luckily, I haven't had one person. I've never seen my art on a secondary market where I didn't hear about it first. Um, yeah. I would be shocked. I'd, my feelings would be hurt, but that would turn immediately to frustration because this is about my business. So mm-hmm. someone would be getting a DM or an email or a call <laughs> or some shit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So good. It's a perfect segue because I would say these are my, my last like cool down questions before the interview. So I was going to say, how does the art business and art practice help or hurt the mental health in certain cases? How does how does the stress of, you know, being a black male, being male, period, being in a smaller city, being a father, how do all of these things play on creating work, selling work and and, uh, exhibiting work? Um, I mean, I was a, a drug addict and alcoholic, so I'm very happy that I'm able to create and maintain my sobriety. Um, I love what I do. I get really excited painting. Mm-hmm. Um, I become a kid. 
I also get frustrated sometimes like anything that you're passionate about because not everything goes right. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think the mental health for me is as your business practice grows, Mm -hmm. it's really hard because when you start, you're just focused on the work. There's yeah. not anything else. So I think it's really hard and it can kind of be depressing to be honest, because I'm, I'm not the only one that talks about it. I've talked yeah. to my peers about it is when your practice gets so big or you start building a pyramid and you're not able to like do what you were doing before. Cause you're too busy in the business. Mm-hmm. Um, that gets, that gets depressing. Cause that work, if you truly love it, it does make you happy. It is your therapy. Yeah. And so sometimes I get a little bit down because I'm like, man, I need to work. Like, I need everyone. My vacation would probably be like 10 days with all my pain supplies by my motherfucking self. <laughs> yeah. See, you know, you, you talk about like vacations right on that same thing. It's like, I don't know if I've ever really had a vacation because even when I'm on vacation, I have my camera, I'm going to museums, I'm doing all the things that I would normally do when I'm out and about doing art stuff. You know what I mean? So it's like, I don't even know that I have one. I tell people that all the time. I'm like, I might take one actual vacation a year, but any city I'm in, I'm trying to maximize the amount of time I have to see as much as possible because there's too much to see. And again, I love this shit. I love this shit. I love art more than I love my sand feet in the sand. Hell yeah. I need my feet in the sand, but I love this being around art and taking those ch- times when I'm in those cities to see an exhibit, to visit the studio there, there, that's the actual like vitamins. I need to come back to my practice to keep going. The feet, my, this, my, my feet in the sand or on a beach. Hell yeah. It's great. But usually what I'm doing that whole time, I may be relaxing, but I'm thinking about what I love. Yeah my kids and my practice. And if they're not on the beach with me, my kids are with me, then I'm going to be thinking a little bit about my practice because I actually love it. I don't need a break. Necess- I mean, I need a break, but like, I love it. Yeah, <laughs> it's hard, no, I, it's hard I, I to explain. You, I know exactly what you mean. Like, do you, <laughs> do you feel that you have everything you need as, you know, a creative, as, you know, someone who's trying to just be, the best creative they can be in practice. Do you feel that you have everything you need or do you feel that there's, you know, some blockages, whether that's industry, whether it's personal, whether that's location or whatever, do you feel that anything is like blocking you from reaching your highest potential? Absolutely. But I just, I mean, yeah, the the galleries, the industry, there's curators, writers, I'm sure people talk, people have their own opinion. It's art. I mean, I, Mm -hmm. I kind of expect it to be part of for the course. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're, the blockers are just like, man, I I come from the corporate world. I'm a black man in America. I've had nothing but blockers. So coming in this art world feels like I'm like, Oh, there's more blockers. And I'm like, what am I going to do? I'm going to first do what I can on my own. And then I'm going to try to build enough power and strength in that to say, where can I actually make progress versus just, hitting my head on a wall so the blockers i have i could i could name multiple things but i'm right now i'm really trying to put myself out there so people Mm -hmm. know that people maybe know a little bit more about what i'm doing what i've done what i plan to do um how serious i'm taking this um again it's kind of like dating i've been i've been single and as an independent artist Mm-hmm. And I could kind of nice. stay in the cut, but I think I kind of want to go out. I want to mingle. I want to put my <laughs> profile on a dating site a little bit and see what bites back. It doesn't mean I might go right back to what I was doing. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I just need to see, I need to see a little bit more what's out there and I need to make sure it's mutual. Um, I was telling my yeah. dad this, I'm like, you know, dad, you see a girl you like, you want to, you want to court her, you want to holler at her. You do it a handful of times, do it another time or two. After so long, I don't care what that girl is or what she looks like or what she brings to you. You're mm-hmm. eventually going to say, no, nah, you're going to look somewhere else. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that's kind of just where I'm at, I guess. Do you feel that, you know, this time around when going back to approach galleries, approach these museums, that you're better equipped and you have a better 
uh, arsenal to come at them with so that you can, you can, you know, take, take these meetings with knowing that you'll get accepted, not with a, a hint of rejection because you've been there, you've done that. And now you're coming with a resume. Yeah, I absolutely have ultimate confidence. And, and there's multiple things that I don't even feel like I'm including mm -hmm. in that sphere of confidence, things I do, things I've done that I'm really proud of. Um, I could go on and on, but one in particular was me and Esteban Whiteside did a collab on the Monopoly. Yeah, I remember that. that was, yep. And that was a hella, hella organic collab. Mm -hmm. um, and me and him have always messed with each other's work and had respect for each other's practice. Yeah. Um, but he had some challenges in the industry from the gallery side. And mm -hmm. when he expressed that to me, and we already had this kind of like collab percolating, when we came together, he came, flew out to Iowa. We, we painted right here behind me, actually. Some of the stuff on the wall is still from when he was here. Um, what we were able to do is we were able to produce 15 to 20 works in that two or three days of like wow. nonstop painting. Small works, bigger works. Mm -hmm. um, and we put them on a little homemade PDF and we sold almost all of them the next morning, like within wow. one day. Wow. And I won't speak about any numbers just out of privacy, but yeah. what we what we did in that 24 hour period was almost equivalent to what he had did at a 50% rate with the entire year of that gallery. Yep. And it was wow. still 50% because it was just me and his boy splitting it, mm -hmm. um, which is the best kind of 50% to me. So that was, it was it. just it was just really cool, and it was a way for me to again give someone else that belief in themselves. He's been rocking independent ever since. Um, give someone else that belief in themselves that they can uh they can do it on their own and so that confidence comes from places like that because i i look around and i see oh this is nice brick and mortar i realize mm -hmm. there's a lot of money and staff and time that's gone in these gallery operations and i'm not mad at it what i do know is i have my own community i've built and my work does sell and i can speak to that so I look at it a lot of times of really a truly partnership because otherwise I'm just cutting, cutting you a check. You ain't cutting me a check. I'm cutting you a check because I'm already cutting a hundred percent of the check from my garage. So anybody I'm going to work with, I'm going to be really looking at those extra things, not just the money. The percentage don't even matter. It could be 60, it could be 40, it could be 50. I don't care. I'm going to be looking at the, the, the partnership. Like, yeah. What does the partnership bring? Because if it's bringing exactly, you know, what I already have, that's not a partnership. That's, you know, that's off the top, that's coat telling, you know, and speaking of, like I mentioned earlier, that's one of the things as a gallerist, as an independent curator or, you know, anyone like that, you have to understand like what value you bring in these spaces. You know, not everybody is going to have the collector every time. Not everybody's going to have the gallery, but there's people that can, really save you money just by putting you on game. There are people that can really help you navigate a situation. And I always tell artists to make sure you have those people in the toolbox too, because everybody is looking out for themselves, you know, yeah. in this art game, especially when it's transactional, you're going to find people that just, you know, are like, like like NBA players that are just lifers, you know, they they might get two minutes a game, two minutes a season, but they still going to be cheering for everything everybody does, you know, and those art people, you know, they're, you got to keep them around because they keep the fun in this game. But you yeah. also have to take that Mamba mentality when you're dealing um, because there's a lot of sharks. And again, we talked about, you know, being able to sell and seeing things on the market you know, there's a lot of that side that artists don't see that blows their mind when they first encounter it, you know, and they don't know how to deal. They thought that a friendship or relationship was one thing. It turns out to be another thing. I mean, there's plenty of stories all through the art world about it. And, you know, just being able to navigate through that is like truly important. Um, but yeah, Absolutely. I want to give you the last word, my brother, anything you want to, you know, bring us up to date on, um, let us know how you're doing anything, anything good we should be looking out for, planning for, and, you know, let us know. Um, I'm really focused on a couple things this year. I have uh, Charlie Brown and Black Snoopy 
um, sculptures nice. coming out. I have some sculptures toys coming out this year, so that'd be nice to have the original Lucy with the cornrows. Oh, have yeah. a little <laughs> little 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 friend. Um, that's something I'm excited for. I actually took the last year and I pulled back almost all my commercial releases. I don't mm. even think I dropped one pop art print all year. Mm. That cost me so much money. I won't even say because I don't want anybody in my pocket. But if yeah. you understood, you know the game. I have three or four of those drops a year. I didn't drop one. I didn't yeah, drop any merch, no T-shirts, yeah. nothing. Here's why. And someone actually, someone actually came up to me recently. And they're like, "Do you have some legal trouble with them?" I'm mm. like, "No, I'm good." I recognize the market shifting a bit and just mm. going a little colder. And what I didn't want to do is I didn't want to constantly keep this this production of supply to where people always just expected it. Mm -hmm. The demand's still there because people like people are legit mad that I yeah. haven't dropped a merch or a print this past year. Yeah, and I know I'll get some fall off, but when I do drop, I'll get that many more plus some yeah. back. Yeah. So for yeah. me, it was really the long grain game, turning down the heat a little bit, not oversaturating. Mm -hmm. I was so focused on that LA, my premier exhibit, uh, solo show exhibit. Um, and it's been really nice. Since then, I had that museum acquisition at the show. Yeah. Um, I've had about four museum acquisitions this year. Um, about three more planned next year. This is all independently too. So my biggest goal is now is to see how I can stay independent. And even though there's mixed feelings on institutions, this is mm -hmm. a game I'm playing. So I want to see how many institutions I can get in based on the merit of my work and my character alone, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. independently. Um, and that's a challenge. It's a big, big fucking challenge. But I like challenges. So that's really my focus. Um, and then, of course, I have my debut museum exhibit solo um which if you if anybody was at my la uh, gallery solo i'm taking that up to a notch that like i'm just really excited man i'm really yeah. excited i'm definitely going to definitely that's, try to that, make out there for that one. we've that's already talked June. about that because i definitely yep. want to see how you turn that one out especially like you know i'm really interested in just seeing like how it is out in iowa like the only thing that I've ever heard about Des Moines before, you know, knowing Jordan was, uh, I remember seeing on the movie Panther about the Black Panthers that they had a Des Moines chapter, you know, in Iowa. And I was like, damn, the Black Panthers made it out to Iowa? Like, what, you know, what's going on? I didn't know it was brothers out there. So it's like, there's, you know, part of my journey as a, a curator, as a consultant, and, a, and as a, just a traveler, you know, to getting out to places and just understanding what's out there because I've, you know, I've found some amazing work, some amazing people and just amazing scenery in places that I never thought as a, a kid I'd be going to. You know what I mean? So, oh, I'm, I already I'm just open. as much as I as, a little and as much as I know about you so far, you would absolutely love from an art perspective here culturally. Yeah, I mean, it is pretty stereotypical, but from an art perspective, it's helped me appreciate it because anytime I go to a larger market or city and I come back here, I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. I, I didn't understand what we're doing here. Um, but I'm excited for it because I'm also going to have a co-current, a studio solo show um, running at the same time the museum show is going. Oh, that's um, good. Yeah, because my concept is this is open studio traffic, but also... Mm -hmm. It's going to give an opportunity to have work display that's also for sale mm -hmm, mm -hmm. while the museum exhibit's going on because I'll have people visiting and traveling in for the show. Yeah. Um, so that co-current, and you, you mentioned some earlier about you don't think people sit with the work long enough. I felt that in my soul. So one of the emphasis, the, an emphasis on this studio show that runs in parallel with the museum show is a focus on restoration, relaxing, um, um, sitting with the work. So I'm yeah. glad you brought that up. So those, are, I'm just really excited to really show my city yeah. on a large scale like that. What I'm, what I'm really about. Yeah, I'm excited. I got, I'm definitely getting out there. But 
So thank you, my brother. We have V. Robert thank Moore you. for joining us on Cultural Canvases. Um, I've been your host, Byron McCleary. It's been an honor to, you know, put out these vibrant stories and perspectives. Stay tuned for the next episode. Subscribe and share. We catch y'all later. Peace. Peace.